This is the brand new Ferrari F8 Spider, and this precise car is 327,000 pounds. I have lived in cheaper houses. The base price of this car, 226,000, is technically less than the equivalent McLaren 720 Spider, but in practice, most F8s are going to be a bit more. The total cost of options on this car is 25,000 pounds more than the entire Porsche Boxster GTS that I returned to Porsche yesterday. In fact, this car is £100,000 more than one of the Lamborghini Huracan press cars currently doing the rounds, and it's almost 200,000 quid more than the Audi R8 rear-wheel drive coupe that I had last year. In fact, it's actually only a little bit less than the Ferrari GTC4 Lusso that I had last year too. And that was a car with two more seats, four more cylinders and all wheel drive. So for this, good enough simply isn't good enough. This car needs to be spectacular. So what actually is the F8? Well, that's actually kind of complicated because if you look at Ferrari's release strategy from the last three decades, it shouldn't exist. For quite a while now, Ferrari have been alternating engine and chassis upgrades with their mid-engine V8 cars. So, for example, the 360 had more or less the 355's engine, but was a totally new chassis. Whereas the 430 was essentially a 360 underneath, but with a brand spanking new engine, and so on and so forth. So, using that logic, this should have taken the 488's engine, which was new for that car, and then done something completely different with the chassis, only they haven't, because underneath you'll find an aluminium architecture that's pretty much the same as was introduced for the 458. It would be very easy to be disappointed with the F8, particularly if you are a person that's obsessed with numbers, statistics, the latest and greatest in technology. There's no carbon chassis under here, there's no interlinked fancy dampers, the engine is one that we've seen before, this really doesn't appear to have brought anything new at all. The McLaren Artura, recently announced, is a totally new car, one that very much looks to the future, whereas this really is looking to the past. It's Ferrari doing something that they actually don't often do. They're not quite resting on their laurels, but I think they're just taking a moment, taking a breather to just look at all the things that they've achieved with their mid-engined V8 supercars, and I suppose you'd call them sports cars, over the last five decades. Something they should rightly be proud of, and something they should certainly have earned the right to celebrate. But is this the right way to do it? Just because it's a band that's getting on a little bit doesn't mean they can't still rock. After all, the engine under here is a masterpiece. This is pretty much the exact same power plant as you'd find in the 488 Pista, which uses parts lifted from the 488 Challenge car in order to produce 720 metric horsepower, 770 newton meters of torque, or just shy of 570 pound-feet. That's put to the rear wheels through the familiar seven-speed twin clutch box. The eight-speed that Ferrari have just developed isn't here. That's gone in stuff like the Roma, that's going in in the new Portofino M, and it's also in the SF90, but not here. And that's fine, because there was nothing wrong with that gearbox, nor was there anything wrong with that engine. Now, Ferrari have somehow shaved just shy of 20 kilos, about 18 overall, from the engine. And if you've seen a Ferrari engine sitting on a stand, there's not really a lot of obvious bits from it you'd say that you could lose, but thanks to clever design and use of more exotic materials, achieve those figures they have. And there's titanium in here, you've got an Inconel exhaust manifold, you have, of course, a pair of lovely turbos, and many manufacturers will tell you that they don't really have any lag in their engines, but Ferrari are telling the truth. Uh, this thing has won many, many awards, and for very good reason. It's about the best V8 twin turbo engine there has ever been. And despite the fitment of the now obligatory petrol particulate filter, the F8 is actually usefully lighter than the outgoing 488. By how much? Well, using some figures I obtained for the 488 GTB and the F8 Tributo, anywhere from a few kilos up to about 50, depending on how brave you are with the options list. 
and I'm hoping this is going to be the start of a renewed focus at Marinello to try and get some weight out of their cars because for quite some time now Woking has really led the charge in terms of making cars lighter and of course their carbon chassis tech over at McLaren also brings benefits in terms of not just performance but also structural rigidity so for convertibles the weight penalty for Ferrari has always been much more than it has for McLaren but I'm hoping going forwards we're going to start to see little improvements in how Ferrari build their cars in fact we're already Already seeing them because with the SF90 C63 with the SF90 you now have some pretty big pieces of carbon melded in with the aluminium to try and fix that problem essentially whilst maintaining the ease of repair and cost effectiveness that aluminium chassis bring styling is of course subjective and yes I know I say that dressed as Uncle Buck when the F8 came out I really wasn't in love with the look at all despite the return to the old quad headlights at the back which for me is something a Ferrari must have the 488 I just couldn't get on with the front end it looked unfinished the Pista though is drop dead gorgeous and this has some of the elements that made the Pista so spectacular including this S duct at the front that doesn't actually rob anywhere near as much storage space as you might think in fact one of the best bits about this car is lifting up the front lid here and revealing the acreage of carbon fiber that is sat under it that of course is part of the over a hundred thousand pounds of options on this car and the previous ferrari press cars i've had weren't really to my taste but this one when they come and collect it in three days time i do hope they give the driver a crowbar because he's going to need it to get me out of this thing this is pretty much how i would spec one of these cars it's absolutely gorgeous I, I probably wouldn't have quite as much carbon fiber and I, I did actually go through the whole process of specking a car and I reckon I'd probably spend about 50,000 pounds in terms of options so for a spider you're looking at about 275 for a coupe about 250 and to me 250 grand suddenly seems a lot more appropriate for this car I've shown it to a few people and they've all said it's absolutely stunning they love it and then when I've asked them to guess the price they've all said they think it's about 150 grand so evidently people now don't really know how much ferraris cost i'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing naturally this being a ferrari a lot of focus has been paid to the car's aerodynamics and in terms of numbers there's only really one ferrari have given me this is 10 percent more aerodynamically efficient than the outgoing 488 spider does that mean it has more downforce well it probably does but more importantly what it means is the car's unlikely to have any more drag and that generally seems to be what a lot of people are concerned about this car will have more than enough downforce to keep you on the ground as mentioned it's got those lovely quad headlights you've got your two exhausts at the back loads more carbon fiber here this by the way this is the kind of carbon i wouldn't specify because if you go over a, a fairly rough piece of road or a really big speed hump it's these pieces down here and at the other end that are going to be the first to suffer and mercifully i have yet to encounter one single vent on this car that isn't functional unusually ferrari chose to release the f8 spider alongside its coupe brethren the tributo and that's not normal in this segment for a couple of reasons what you typically expect is to see the coupe first followed about 18 months to two years later by the convertible and the reasoning is fairly simple first off it takes a little more time to develop a convertible with their complex roof mechanisms and all that jazz and this is the car people usually want to buy so why would you release that last well because you want people to buy the coupe version first all those people that are desperate to get into the latest and greatest new ferrari or mclaren or porsche or whatever it is and then you sell them another car two years down the line the one that they actually wanted well with this car ferrari have released them simultaneously and that's maybe the way they're going to be doing things from now on but i think more likely a sign of the fact that this car isn't going to have its normal life cycle i asked a couple of ferrari dealers if anyone was actually bothering buying the coupe and it turns out a lot of people are and the reasoning is simple the coupe has an absolutely gorgeous lexan window here a very clear nod to one of the most famous mid-engine v8 ferraris of all time the f40 and honestly having seen an f8 tributo in the flesh <laughs> i can't blame him it does look really good but then so does this a lot more cohesive i think than the sf90 which is perhaps a touch too busy but then i've not seen too many of those for too long in the flesh either so maybe that'll work but for me i've always been a fan of classic ferraris and this clearly 
wants to be a classic Ferrari. Despite Ferrari's obsession with technical details, this to me is not a car about the numbers. That being said though, it's still got some fairly impressive ones. We may have become desensitized to incredible performance figures now, but you need to remind yourself, anything with more than 700 horsepower that'll do naught to 60 in less than three seconds and over 210 mile an hour is not slow. And keeping you out of the hedgerow, you have of course Ferrari's latest suite of dynamic enhancement software, which means that hopefully you'll be able to use all of that power and ability with some confidence. The interior of the car is where there is absolutely no hiding. This has a direct link back to the 458 because ultimately the architecture is pretty much the same. There are some more buttons and some detail improvements like the much easier to use indicators, but largely it's uh, pretty familiar to anyone that's driven a Ferrari from the last 10 years. There are things both good and bad. First off, the spec. Love it. Absolutely brilliant. Black and yellow. Classic combination. JBL Hi-Fi works okay. Screens are nice and clear. I like the proper buttons on the wheel. I prefer these over the ones you've now got on the SF90 and the Roma, although the screen in those cars is a lot better. I don't like the fact that some things are still in cheap plastic when this is not a car that should have cheap plastic in it, like the little HVAC controls down there. There are some marks on the carbon too, although I think they could be from cleaning. The little air vent dials here feel really cheap and nasty. There's some odd stuff too, like the fact that some of the window controls have silver edges on them, but the rear window and convertible roof controls have black edges on them. And this little lever here, which opens up the rear, I'm pretty convinced is the same as you'd find in a 355. I know we want to have a bit of a throwback to some of those old cars, but um, using pieces from the 90s, I'm not quite sure that's what we want to be doing. Overall though, the feeling in here is of something that's exceedingly well put together, if a little rough around some of its edges. In other words, it's a Ferrari, all right. But is it a Ferrari which deserves to go down in history alongside all of these many brilliant cars that it's so keen to pay tribute to? Well, that we're not gonna find out in a car park, are we? Now here's the thing about cars. I'm not sure about you, but for me, when I get in one, it doesn't really take that long to work out whether I like it or not. In fact, when it comes to really sporty things like this, it takes no time at all. You know instantly whether this is a car you're going to get on with, or you're just never really going to see eye to eye. The more day-to-day -day cars, those are the complicated ones because their talents are not so obvious. The truth is, the F8 and I, we get on just fine, and I'll say, that is a surprise. There are many Ferraris I've driven that have been very good cars and indeed extremely desirable, but they've fallen over in some key areas. Now some I can find forgiveness for, like the 355, because, well, it's old and you're always gonna have a, a little bit more room to forgive a classic like that. It's so beautiful and it sounds so good, but the driving experience isn't really up to it. Does it matter that much? Well, <laughs> with something like this, yeah, it, it does really matter. The price Ferrari are asking, even if you take away the insane amount of options on this car, it, it better be damn good. However, this is not a clear victory. And this is where my job gets interesting because it's one thing just to say, yes, I like it or, or no, I don't. Anyone can do that. The tricky bit of my job is then verbalizing that, putting into words just why it is that I love the car, what does work, what doesn't work. And I think the perspective you view this car from is going to be absolutely key to whether you're going to enjoy it or not. But first, I do need to fix something. That's better. There is something magic about this kind of car with no roof on it. I'm still not sure whether I prefer the looks of this or the coupe. I think maybe the coupe just edges it. I've always been a coupe person. But this, like the 488, when you have the spider, the window line changes quite dramatically and it's got a bit of Enzo in its side profile. The big, real surprise for me 
it's the steering on this car because it's actually really good. This has been an area where Ferrari have fallen short in many a car. Even in the much lauded 458, I just didn't feel like it was truly great steering. That was another area where, to be entirely honest, Woking was ahead of the game, as were Lotus in fact. And Ferraris have just tended to have steering that's both very fast and very light. And that means that getting the confidence in them isn't always the easiest thing. Maybe the worst example of that being, say, the F12 that I drove. However, this actually has a real weight to it. You feel like you're genuinely connected to the road. And it does have a little bit of texture. It does wriggle for an electronic power-assisted system. This is really genuinely very good. And this thing's got serious firepower. The dynamic software that Ferrari have actually really does do what they claim it will. I've got confidence to push on in this car. I will put my foot down a little bit more than I think I probably should and I'll enjoy what happens. The car's got reasonable grip, but ultimately 700 horses and a shed load of torque through two wheels is going to be interesting. And I'll admit, I have laid a couple of pretty fat 11s on some of the local roads entirely unintentionally. But it wasn't scary. That's the mad thing. I, I'm not a slidey person. I don't do that sort of thing. And this is the last thing you'd expect to do that in. This is a 327,000 pound car that belongs to somebody else. And I will have to have a very awkward discussion with Ferrari if I bend it. But yet still, I feel so confident to push on with this thing. It's sensational. However, not without flaw. And there are two that I think you might consider real big deal breakers. One you can solve, but the other you can't. First off, the noise. There isn't really one is there it sounds all right it sounds nice and when you're sat in here it certainly sounds like you are in a ferrari but a ferrari that's quite far away however i have heard a few of these with aftermarket systems on and they sound utterly incredible the noise though doesn't actually bother me because i'll be honest as i've gotten a little bit older the idea of a car with an ear splittingly loud exhaust has just become a bit tiresome i like a good quality sound but in terms of quantity, so long as I can hear it, that's fine. And I can always hear the F8 when I want to, so it doesn't stop me enjoying it. Some other cars I've driven, they've been so quiet, you don't even know when to change gear. That's not a problem here. Yes, I, I do wish there was a button where I could make it just that little bit louder so I could just enjoy it that little more. And yeah, I wish it really screamed at the top end, but that's just not going to happen. Not from a factory perspective. So that's the one you can deal with. The problem you can't fix as a result of Ferrari having locked the roof off. I read in a number of reviews people talking about the scuttle shake in this car. And I'll be honest, scuttle shake is not something that tends to bother me in a lot of convertibles. Very few I've driven have actually had a noticeable amount. My mother's Mark 1 Audi TT convertible being a good example. But generally speaking, I, I don't really find it to be an issue. In this though, it is. There's lots of shake, lots and lots, so much so that it, it took me by surprise the first time I took this car out and all, all the roads around me I think are designed explicitly to exaggerate the problem because they're, they're pretty poorly paved roads and, and this car just wobbles about like a, a wibbly wobbly thing on a wobble board. On smoother roads I don't think you'd really notice it so much and it certainly doesn't stop you making progress but it is there, it's always there, you feel it, it's, it's a real part of the car. People do love this car, people really, really like this car. Set that to one side and the rest of the package really is quite magnificent. Easily some of the finest steering Ferrari have done ever, an engine that is absolutely magnificent. The sensation of being in something really quite special and it does all add up to, ultimately, a very good package. But let's just double check, shall we, and give it a quick blast down my favourite road.
you've got the usual Manatino down here and I'm actually driving this car in race because it's dry enough and I've got the confidence in the car. I, I started off in sport but I found that race just lets the car slip and slide just a little more but it still reins it in long before things get really out of hand. I am also in the bumpy road mode, but I'll be honest, I find the regular suspension actually pretty decent. This is certainly a firmer car than, say, the 458. That, that rode really quite well, as did the F12. So I'm going to be very interested to see what the 812 is like. I should be driving one of those in a couple of months. See how that compares. <laughs> above about 3,500 RPM and it is absolutely sensational. Now in truth, it's not as quick as a McLaren 720, although I've only driven the coupe version, which naturally will be faster as it would be with the F8. And the McLaren's engine, I think, actually journalists are perhaps a little too hard on. Many of them call it totally anodyne and unexciting and they, they complain a lot about even the 720, whereas the 720 engine, I felt, was a dramatic improvement over that which came before. That as an example, I would never try doing that in anything else. This car, it just works. It's magic. Gearbox is excellent. In fact, the only thing I can think of which is better is the eight speed that they also make. And that will surely come in the next car. The brakes I actually quite like too. Some of the previous Ferraris I've driven have felt a, li a little bit too grabby, especially with the ceramics, and the 488 was particularly bad for it. This seems a lot better. That could be, because I'm wearing my, my Pilotti trainers today, and they've got a very thin sole on them, so they're really quite good for modulating the brakes. Lack of a reversing camera is very disturbing. It should just be standard on a car like this. It's rapid. It's really rapid. Anyone that's just unimpressed by the turn of speed in this thing, I feel sorry for you. I really do. Power is there all the way from about four to 8,000, and Ferrari have even programmed this so that when you get right to that red line, it doesn't start to tail off at all. It will make all of its power up until the point that it doesn't make any at all. It does feel generally more naturally aspirated than many other turbocharged cars that I drive, and I think that helps give you a bit more confidence with it. You don't have that big spike of torque low down. It's a, an easy thing to manage. So, is the Ferrari F8 worth your hard-earned money? Well, as Obi-Wan said, that all depends if you see it from a certain point of view. If you're looking to buy this as what it is, a nod, a tribute, a throwback, a last hurrah of the past 50 years of Ferrari mid-engine V8s, yes, every single penny of it, this car really is one of my favourite Ferraris, and actually one of my favourite cars that I've driven ever. I don't say that lightly. This morning I filmed a review with a Lotus Evora S and you all know how much I absolutely adore that car. This, yes, it's a hell of a lot more expensive. It's like 10 times the money, so ignore that because that's law of diminishing returns. But this really does feel a big step on. If you had an Evora and you got in one of these, you're gonna go, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, I get it, I get it. Other Ferraris, you might not do that, but this one, I think you would. However, if you are a McLaren owner or a McLaren fan, you maybe had a few of those already and you're thinking of buying your first Ferrari, well, I don't think this is the right car for you to buy. Specifically, 
I don't think the Spider is the right car for you to buy because it's in this format where this car is at its weakest and the McLarens are at their strongest. The 720 Spider is a generally very well built car, obscenely quick. Now I haven't driven one of those. I know a few journalists said that it, it did actually suffer a little bit from the loss of its roof, but I'm fairly confident that it's not going to be anywhere near as wibbly as this. In fact, the 600 LT that I've driven quite a bit, Spider, that's rock solid in comparison to this. So on that front, if you're the sort of person obsessed with technical details and outright speed and all that jazz, no, you, you get in this, you go, oh, well, this is why McLaren's so much better. But if you're willing to see it for what it is, I think you'll really enjoy it. Ferrari have been working for a very long time to earn themselves a, I think, well-deserved breather. And this car is a, a fine automobile. But going forwards, this kind of stuff, I'm not going to give them a free pass anymore. You've got one Ferrari, you've got one from me. But your next car that I drive, if I got in the SF90 and it was like this, that's not acceptable. Not at any money, and certainly not at this money. Ferrari have certainly made some decent progress in making these cars a little bit easier to own, a little bit more affordable. Seven year service plan, four year warranty, all that sort of jazz. But there's other areas I think they can improve. We need more stuff as standard. Reversing camera should just be standard, please, Ferrari. Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, stop charging a fortune for that kind of stuff. In fact, you, you can't even have Android Auto in this, I don't think. Apple CarPlay doesn't even work very well, and it's two and a half thousand pounds. That's just not right. Your engine is stunning. Your design is fabulous. Even these seats, which initially I did not get on well with because they've got this weird gap in them, I actually really rather like. I enjoy the driving position of this car. I also enjoy the McLaren driving position. They're, they're dramatically different. Both have their merits, and I, I like them equally, I would say. I think the McLaren is probably the technically superior one, but I enjoy the way the F8's laid out, the way it makes me feel. If I was going to have one of these, and believe me, if I had the money right about now, I would be chatting with Meridian. I think it would genuinely cause me some real sleepless nights working out whether I wanted the convertible or the coupe. The coupe, I'm quite convinced, is going to fix all the dynamic issues, but I do rather like the wind in my hair. What a nice dilemma that would be to have. Anyway, thanks all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.